Good morning, colleagues, and uh, welcome to a debate on real-world learning, bringing education to life. And I think all of us who are gathered here for this debate recognise that the 2012 WISE gathering has placed at the centre real-world learning. So uh, there's a sense, I think, in which all of us believe that what we have witnessed over the last couple of days has put the emphasis upon what in learning these days needs to be relevant, applied. We have the WISE 2012 book that was launched yesterday, Learning a Living, talking about the importance of rethinking the nature of real world learning for all young people to ensure that they are powerful learners with the appropriate 21st century skills to thrive and survive in a 21st century environment and of course to become global citizens in the way that we heard of this morning. And in addition to that, Andreas Schleicher's presentation last night put skills at the centre of the agenda and again made clear that we are talking about new skills for a new world of work and that if we don't put the emphasis on real world learning, then we will not be preparing young people adequately for what is now their emerging present, let alone their future. In preparation for this debate, we had the challenge that was expressed as too often learning is passive and theoretical, there's ample evidence that motivation is increased and learning more effective when the process is participative, relevant to real world issues. We asked people if they might respond to that and can I let you know that 87% have responded in the affirmative, namely that in fact too often learning is passive and theoretical and we do need to increase the applied and the relevant. My name is Tony McKay. I have the delight uh, of being the, the dialogue or debate chair, and I now want to welcome a most remarkable panel. Uh, and we have been communicating with, with each other over the last few days in preparation for this morning's debate. So I'm going to ask each panel member if they might just introduce themselves. Noor, let me start with you. Okay, great. So my name is Noor Dukmak. I'm a third year undergraduate student at MIT, and I major in math. I'm also on my way to completing a teaching certificate so that I'm licensed to teach in Massachusetts as soon as I graduate. And um, I'm, I don't know if you noticed from my voice, I'm a little sick. Actually, yesterday I was losing my voice and I was you know, scared that I wasn't going to be able to be here today. But uh, luckily, I don't know if anyone has heard of the debate about uh, who's more important, the doctor or the teacher, right? And the doctor takes care of the teacher, and the teacher teaches the doctor, and now I've realized the importance of doctors. <laughs> so um, that's me. No, it was great that you are here. So thank you very much. Marwan. Um, I'm Marwan Tarazi from Brzezit University in Palestine. I'm currently the director of the Center for Continuing Education. And I started off at the Center for Continuing Education. I mean, by default, by design, uh, continuing education is supposed to do real world learning. And then it was interesting for me because I discovered at some point we were doing something that's supposed to be relevant and real world, but we turned out to be lecturing, giving lectures about some examples and some case studies. And that still didn't re achieve the impact that we wanted to get into the, the, the community they were working with. And slowly we realized we had to go actually more than real world. We had to go out and do things with the community, with the people, with the trainees that we were working with. And lo and behold, we discovered that we ended up, our mission changed from training unit to an institutional capacity building unit because this is basically what it took to build the capacity of education, of, of institutions. You have to train and you have to work with them and you have to do real work with them. And then we shifted, one, not we didn't shift one of our key focus areas is institutional capacity building for educational institutions. And having gone down that path, we ended up working a lot with the concepts, which we, we started off with adult learning and adult education. We started off putting them into basic education. And this is where I'd like to you know, bring into this session, I hope. Thank you, Moan. That's wonderful. Paul. Thanks, Tony. I'm at the other age extreme to, to know, as you can see. <laughs> uh, 
I'm currently in Singapore at the National Institute of Education, where I'm Dean for Graduate Studies and Professional Learning. And my main challenge in Singapore, and by the way, I want to thank Andreas very much yesterday for giving so much visibility to Singapore. I've got to lift, lift the, the reputation down now. My main challenge in, you know, at the Institute really is to provide opportunities for in-service teachers to continue growing, to maintain their passion for teaching. But more importantly, to make sure that their own personal interests resonates well, I think, with the needs of education in, in, in Singapore under a changing landscape. Uh, my professional interests are rather diverse. Uh, I recently uh, launched uh, a, uh, uh, something called the Rice Bowl Index, which is a tool to educate planners on how to look at food security. So that's adult education in a sense. I'm also a fish farmer uh, on the weekend. And my interest there really is to look at giving experiences to my students. I, I teach a class in, in resource management, some real world, real life experiences on my fish farm. I'm really looking forward to, to contributing and participating in this uh, particular dialogue. Yeah, thank you. Paul, thank you very much. Okay, the, the process that we're going to use is we're going to divide the debate into three parts. We were gonna make it four parts, and the first part was going to be about the compelling case for real, real world learning. But I think most people in this room do not need to be convinced of this. Everybody is now saying, uh, as the 87% who voted in the poll said, that this has got to be the way in which we think about not just simply what the emphasis might be in learning, but how you would reorganise learning. Reorganising learning to ensure that the real world is very much part of the way in which we think about teaching and learning. And it's often expressed now in terms of problem-based, inquiry-based learning. So I think we're going to take as given that most of us know that this is what we need to shift to. Now, that's, if there's any controversy about that, we'll hear that in questions. We've got three parts to the debate. The first part is we want to know what does an emphasis, a shift to real-world learning look like in terms of curriculum and pedagogy. So part one is, how is it expressed in curriculum? And how do you go about real world learning in terms of pedagogical approaches, teaching approaches? And by the way, what part does technology play? So that's part one. Part two is, what would we need to do differently in how we prepare the educator workforce to be more adequate, to ensure that real world learning in fact, is going to be effective. So we want to put the focus in the second part on teacher preparation and continuing professional learning. And in the third part, we want to ask the question, why is it that we don't seem to have the implementation of real-world learning taking place perhaps to the scale that you'd expect? Are there barriers in different countries to taking on a real-world learning focus? Is it true that, in fact, in some places there's resistance, that the policy environment is not conducive? So that's part three. So let me begin with part one, and can I just make it clear, colleagues, that after each brief contribution, we are going to go straight to you. So you don't have to wait till the end to participate. We're going to invite you to come in after each part and ask for your comments and your questions, and I'll pick up on Twitter feed as I go. Paul, let me start with you. Um, real world learning, the challenge for curriculum, the challenge for pedagogy? Okay, well, well, well let me just start perhaps by reiterating a couple of points that you made and which were made by other speakers yesterday. The first really is, you know, what are we readjusting our curriculum and pedagogy for? Right. I think Andreas made the point about, you know, 21st century skills, the four C's, you know, critical thinking, you know, collaborative problem solving, communication uh, to some extent. Uh, and then, finally, critical thinking. Okay? I think we've got to have that as a background. Then the second really is, and I think, okay, there's been a lot of importance we heard yesterday from many speakers about the need for real-world learning and why we need to adjust our curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, when listening to the speakers, one takeaway message that I actually had, you know, forming my own mind was that we can't afford to throw basically the baby away with bathwater. In other words, not everything lends itself to real-world learning. I think there's a very fundamental principles which you have to abide by, which doesn't lend itself to real-world learning. Now, having said that, 
I think there are some real challenges we face to incorporate more real-world learning into our curriculum and pedagogy. One, I think, is the balance. The balance between what inherently is more unstructured experiential learning when you try and do real-world learning with the more structured curriculum and pedagogies that we're so used to in conventional schools. Okay, and I think most of us are educators know that assessment books, for example, drive very much the way we teach. Yeah? So how do you actually deal with that balance? I think this is a really key, key problem that we face, even in Singapore. The second really you know, is to link the particular pedagogic, pedagogical approach with useful, appropriate real-world case studies. You know, problem-based learning, for example, you know, case study and, and so on, yeah? Can we find some real-world situations? And it's actually quite difficult for schools. I mean, beyond schools, the workplace is a bit more, more simple. I think with, with engineers, with doctors and so on, I think you can transfer real-world learning situations into the classroom much easier. Yeah, I, I think anyway. Now, the third really is to, uh, to look at, you know, I kind of facetiously said, you know, when we're discussing within the panel, if you can't take a prophet to the mountain, you can bring a mountain to the prophet, okay? And this is where, if you can't take students to real-world situations, how do you then bring real-world situations into the classroom itself? How do we actually facilitate that? Now, this is where I, I really feel technology comes in. Again, most of us are educators are very familiar with pedagogical content knowledge, the Lee Schumann concepts. I think the, uh, the kind of latest reinvention of the concept, of course, is TPAC, right, the technology uh, pedagogical content knowledge. And we're seeing now good examples of that throughout the world, actually. I was in Shanghai recently. I'm surprised to find schools there, they are beaming classroom situations into teacher training institutes and having teachers actually dissect what the real teachers are doing in the classrooms. Now, that's one use of, of technology, ICT. Now, the other, of course, in the, you know, in the, we're working with the Medical Council in Singapore as well, to look at augmented reality. Okay? Before somebody actually dives in the cadaver, can he or she do simulations on how to cut up bodies, basically? Uh, I mean, that is the second example. The third that, that I personally deal with quite a bit is the so-called practicum. Okay? Because after all, you know, for the teacher, Okay. His or her classroom really is an ecosystem. Okay. So being able to function in the ecosystem re requires a fair amount of practice. So to us, the practicum is where the real world meets with the theory. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll, I'll probably I should stop there, I think, Tony. It's not no, that's going. <laughs> I'm just checking Thank to you. see uh, the nature of people's immediate responses, and I'll come back to that. But, uh, let me just ask you this, Paul, though. In, as you think about... Uh, real-world learning, and you locate that within a Singapore context, uh, your primary site, but your comments are inclusive of whatever context, whatever setting, whatever stage of growth and development? In general, yes. Although one has to qualify one's statements as you look at particular countries. Yeah. Now, I've worked in some of the poorest you know, areas of the world, yeah. basically trying to train rice farmers. And our real-world uh, real learning there actually is to have, for example, field schools located in farmers' fields themselves. Yes, yes. Where they actually learn the principles of biology and we have school children actually going to the schools. They actually link what they learn in class with their parents' problems in dealing with, say, rice pest management, as an yep. example. Yep. Yeah. So, so I think really, it's really situation-oriented, uh, I think. Well, I think just over the last couple of days, we've had uh, numerous examples of precisely what you're talking about being revealed across different uh, geographies. Um, no, okay, let me come to you now. What do you think? Um, as you say, you are at the point, I, we should just acknowledge that we have amongst our presence here a wise learner. Yes, uh, exactly. So uh, we are delighted that you are with us and thank you, if we can just uh, acknowledge that. So here you are launching uh, into the next part of your own career, but you're also travelling on behalf of WISE. So you see what is starting to emerge in terms of real world learning. Uh, what's your own view about how this might be expressed in curriculum and pedagogy? Well, first, I want to definitely thank WISE for, for the WISE Learner's Voice program because it's just absolutely, as I think everyone here agrees, an initiative that is crucial to the conversations that we're having. It's crucial to be able to participate and also um, to go ahead and, and kind of travel around and, and be part of the conversations that are happening everywhere around the world. Now for me as a learner, I'm, I'm in the learning process, I'm at MIT and everyone thinks, you know, oh, MIT, you know, it's, it must be a great, 
you know, a great place of learning, and, and I'm sure all the learning that happens is, is optimal and everything like that. Unfortunately, you know, even MIT has its challenges, uh, especially in the math department. Math is definitely the, you know, one of the more abstract and theoretical uh, subjects. And you know, to this day, a typical math lecture looks like you know, a professor coming into the classroom, performing for 50 minutes, writing on the board, and kind of just leaving. And unless a student is really, you know, very insistent on asking a question, um, the professor is happy to just to do just that. So, you know, I think these conversations uh, need to keep happening everywhere, really. Um, and we're all looking for answers. During my teacher preparation program, I was exposed to a lot of different teachers. So I actually taught at a Boston public high school. I taught calculus and pre-calculus for several months. And, you know, that kind of uh, speaks to the, the type of preparation that we're getting is it's really, you know, in the classroom and it's really practical and real world experience in terms of teacher preparation, which is important. But um, we also got to, I also personally made it a point to visit other teachers' classrooms and sit and observe. And, and you know, I'd kind of ask the students, who's the good teacher, who are the good teachers, who are the bad teachers, um, and kind of observe what they did. And I, I came across several stories. Uh, one really powerful story for me was when a, a teacher told me that he knew um, a colleague who was, who was a geometry teacher who used to hold his classes like a court case. And he would divide his class into two teams, and each team uh, was to, um, he, would, he would project a diagram on the board. The diagram had, you know, shapes and lines and angles and, and different values were given, and each team was to make a claim about the figure. So, you know, angle A is equal to 37 degrees and prove it. And all the while, the other team is supposed to be uh, pointing out flaws in the arguments. And I think that this type of a setup reflects a real world situation, not just in the you know, legal systems. This is something that happens over dinner tables and happens everywhere whenever you're trying to argue your point. And quite frankly, I don't see why my combinatorial analysis class that I'm taking right now can't be set up in the same way. It's, it's proving. So, you know, I think that it's important when we talk about real world learning that we don't only focus on changing necessarily the content of what we're learning, but also changing the process through which we learn that content. Um, if you'll allow me to give another example, I, I love examples because I'm so close to this. Um, you know, if, if a middle school teacher notices that her kids are uh, spending hours and hours uh, trading Pokemon cards or, you know, something of that sort, well, why not incorporate, you know, the concept of trading or bartering into her math or science or even history lesson and getting kids to think of problems, you know, suddenly a, a math problem, suddenly a science problem becomes a problem that they're used to solving. And so, again, kind of using the process to, um, to kind of drive the motivation to learn. Well, you've got a friend uh, on Twitter who says, to me, real world learning is not about the content in the main, it's about the effectiveness of learning. Now, we might want to debate this, uh, but let's just hold off on that for a moment. Marwan, how would you like to enter into the debate? I come from a place where it's, uh, you know, the, the, the ecosystem, the learning ecosystem at the schools is very difficult. <clears throat> and I think what I'm about to talk about applies to most of the developing world. I mean, you have a situation, you have a textbook, and it's predefined what you have to teach, and then it's overloaded with information, and then you have a supervisor or inspector, or whatever they're called, different places, that typically, typically comes and checks that you are, you have finished you know, you know, today by November, you finished chapter three between your should be around pages 17 to 29. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you have teachers that are underpaid 
and uh, they, they, they have limited amount of time. So the, the, the ecosystem for getting to start thinking towards doing things like real world learning, which is basically coming out of the standard textbook and what you're expected to do and what you're paid to do and what you're or underpaid to do, uh, it becomes a serious challenge. So, so the problem for us, the challenges for us is, is, are, are enormous. I, we can maybe elaborate on that later, but, but for now, I think, the idea is once you have a really rigid system, it's really difficult to start thinking about real world learning or any of the new learning paradigms you're talking about, you know, creative thinking, problem solving, you know, uh, research, etc. These are real uh, values that you need to get in, put into the educational system that the current system is not designed to and it has very little entry points so that you can break this. Let me just be clear here then, uh, Paul, we've got a bit of a spectrum in terms of how we want to position this. Depending upon uh, the current system, the dominant current system, as you have outlined, Marwan, there's a bigger challenge to make the shift, both in terms of content and in terms of pedagogy, but potentially it could be accelerated through the power of technology in the way that Paul's talked about. But um, um, am I getting you right when you say that this will be a bigger challenge to move into real-world learning environments in, in Palestine and in other developing countries? Yes, definitely. It's, and, it's... and say more as to what, whether or not you think you can leapfrog into this space. Can you accelerate into that space? I know we're going to return to that later, but um, you at the moment are an advocate for this approach. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, this is what we have to... I'm not, I'm not saying that... We're saying this is the current status, but we really need to think outside the box. We have to break, yeah. you know, the current system with its variables is not just not going to do the kind of real world learning that we're talking about. You know, you need to do, in, investigate, in, in, invest in teacher education, you need to invest in curricula, you need to do so much. And the classical model, the way it's designed, is just not going to allow you to do the kind of uh, changes that you're looking for. Um, Whereas in Paul's case, Paul, I think you'd be saying that your system has already shifted you are, you are down the road in terms of integrating more real-world learning into your current approaches. And, and we're doing that because the system allows us to do that with right. technology. Okay. But, but you know, in, in a sense, I, I disagree with Marvin. I think, I think you can just situate your approach depending on the environment and the ecosystem, basically, yes. in which your, your teaching learning is done. I might give the example of working with poor farmers. You know, now I've, you know, parts of China, Yunnan, I've been to really poor villages where the, the children study under the same conditions that we saw this morning yes. on the slides, you know? And yet the teachers have been innovative enough to bring the real world issues into the classroom, okay? And then use basically the signs to help illustrate certain principles, yeah? And in this, the case I dealt with, many were rice, rice growing communities, you know? So they were teaching children life cycles, okay? And also food webs, you know? And, and, and how do you learn that? By, going to the real world, bring the real world into the classroom, looking at, I'm a, bi a biologist, looking at you know, what are the, the predators, what are the prey, and so on, actually. And, and very powerful lessons. So it doesn't all the time require high tech, or ICT for that matter. Yeah, it's understanding what the principles are, yeah. Yeah, and then applying those to particular real world situations. Well, we're not getting too yeah. much argument on the Twitter feed at the moment, so let me get out to, the, to uh, our colleagues and get a microphone down the front. Could people introduce themselves? Okay, so I'm Malak Zalouk, and I come from a country from Egypt where we've had 7,000 years of centralized type governance. So the ecosystem is also not that amenable to these kinds of changes. However, in the 90s, uh, I was deeply involved in setting up a community school initiative in the hard to reach areas of rural Egypt, where we did three things that relate to what you were discussing. The first thing was that we kind of abolished what we call extracurricular activities. We just made them curricular. So this nomenclature that we find in a lot of traditional systems, oh, let's do some extracurricular activities, which means they're not assessed and they're outside your regular 
teaching time. We actually made them within the teaching time, and they were assessed through authentic assessment and child portfolios. So the extracurricular activities were things like students doing their own committees for health, and they were going out to advocate for health issues in the rural village, and these were graded because they were doing statistics, and they were doing all kinds of other amazing types of activities. We also did the second thing, which was to integrate the curriculum. So whereas we were doing a history class, we were also doing a media class, because there was a child actually interviewing a historical figure about why they did what they did and how they could have done it differently. And the class was engaged in a historical debate which had critical analysis but also communication, media, etc. and other skills. We also did humanitarian approaches. So things like friendship and love were part of the curriculum. So whereas we had a whole week talking about voluntary work, we talked about values, we talked about friendship, but children were also writing letters to their friends, and so they were doing whole language, but they were also befriending others. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A second, uh, if we can just pass the microphone to the back and people can introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Andrew Lehman. I'm the Chief Executive of the Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry. But I was a teacher for 30 years and a school principal, so I have some background in education. It seems to me that the problem is methodology as much as anything else. And I'd like to make three points about that, if I may. First of all, I think that many teachers uh, are inhibitors of real world uh, learning because they, they're not in the real world. I think educators are often quite remote from the real world, particularly in terms of the world of work. The second point is that in my experience, and admittedly I'm going back a few years, many teachers used methodologies that they had experienced in the classroom themselves. So they were not using modern methodologies to teach modern children. And the third point is that once upon a time, it was a case of one size fits all. In other words, teacher methodology was based on a supply uh, issue, not a demand issue. The modern world involves much more individual identity among the people who sit in classrooms and learn. So one size fits all simply doesn't work anymore. And I'm not sure if teacher education takes sufficient account of individual differences because they are really part of the real world. It's very interesting that you say that, just as I go to my third uh, colleague, that in fact we've got on the Twitter feed here a number of people saying that it's not possible to have real world learning, authentic learning, unless it's personalised that is the antithesis of one size fits all. So we'll pick this up. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Jim Gordon, and I'm the founder and director of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in the USA. I'm a psychiatrist, and for the last 20 years, we've been working in schools to help teachers, administrators, and the kids in schools learn how to understand and help themselves. And we've worked in conflict zones. We work in Gaza. We've worked with about 40,000 children in Gaza, Kosovo, Haiti, as well as in the US and in Israel. And one of the things that's crucial to me, and I'd like to hear your comments about it, and I'd also like to talk with people who are interested in this kind of work, is that kids who are under stress, and particularly kids who are traumatized, and that happens in the US as well as in other places around the world, um, need to have a basic education in self-awareness and self-care. They need to learn how to help themselves and to be available to help each other. And we teach the, the basic principles of self-care, relaxation, meditation, self-expression in words, drawings, and movement. And what we've observed is that it changes the whole climate in the schools. And that the children, or we also work with medical students, they learn better, they feel more relaxed, more hopeful and more optimistic about the future. And to me, this seems to me to be fundamental. Most health courses are very abstract or kind of boring for kids. 
And I think it's really crucial, and I want to put this forward, that this kind of self-care become a regular part of education. And I wonder about your comments about it, and I'd enjoy talking with others here who are interested, particularly those in situations of conflict. So thank you. Thank you. Let me just come back to the panel then. You might want to pick up on any of those three, but let me just uh, refresh uh, the point that we've reached. I think I, there could be commentary on the notion of moving into a more holistic approach and not dividing extracurricular from curricula and putting greater emphasis on the integrated. There could be a response to some of the principles that have been outlined as a way forward, or indeed making sure that we understand that real world learning is about self and well-being as much as it is about other areas of knowledge. So, a response. Noor, do you want to start? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, I'm actually working on a project for Syrian refugee children education, um, for Syrian refugees in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. And I think, I mean, what you said is, is crucial. Their, you know, well-being is probably even more important than, I mean, not probably, it is more important than, you know, learning physics or chemistry or biology. And it should, you know, I think that any sort of education that is delivered to them should go hand in hand with clinical psychologists, people who understand their needs, given, through, given what they've, they've gone through. And similarly, you know, this idea of um, incorporating ideas of love and friendship and um, all of these things that really help us to nurture ourselves I mean, this is thing, these, are, these are things that we are taught at, at college, like we're never taught it before. And for some reason, you know, society has decided that, you know, when you're at, in college, you are ready to talk about these things with other people, but before that, you're not. And to be honest, they've helped me personally through my life and through my studies and, and getting through, you know, academics. And I think it would be great to introduce, you know, obviously there should be care taken and in introducing them before, but I think that there is no reason we shouldn't. And I think that they can only enhance the kind of the school experience of children. Thank you. Marwan. Um, you know, there, there's two, two key points here. They're, they're, they're important. There's uh, equivalent, I, I work in development. I mean, so basically we're looking at two definitions. One is relief and one is development, or I'd like to use the analogy. In relief, you have a problem somewhere and you try to do some relief immediate quick interventions to improve a situation for a number of, of stakeholders, of, of people who need your support, need beneficiary. Now there's something else called development. Development is when you look at something long-term, structured, that uh, turns institutionalize a process. And this is what we're interested in. I mean, personally, you know, this is what the work we're doing. Um, the examples that have been given about working with communities and turning extracurricular into curricular, I mean, these are beautiful examples, and working with the well-being of children. I mean, those are the kind of things everybody wants, we're all dreaming about, and this is the kind of learning systems we want in, in developing world. And in, in developed organizations, a lot of this happens by default. Teachers can do it, schools are, are open to doing that. But in a developing context, the challenge is how can we this benefit of this project that works with 40, 400, 4,000 people, how can we make it a sustainable, structured system and this, so that it becomes part of an ongoing process? And, and this is sort of the, 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 there's a difference between the two. We can learn from those models, but a very important challenge is how can we take this learning, institutionalize it, and scale it? Yeah. Scale is scale at at an affordable cost. It has to be scaled affordably. Yes. So it, these are the issues. And it genuinely does become an ecosystem of learning. Yeah, which is in fact where you started, Paul. Uh, comment? Well, perhaps on, on the second gentleman. You know, I think, uh, you know, if we go back to yesterday's plenary, uh, teachers basically are at the center of any attempt to, to change, you know, curriculum and pedagogies and so on, really. Uh, and, and we were finding, you know, that part of what I do in Singapore is, you know, trying create situations where teachers who have been trained, I uh, purposely use the word trained as teachers, yeah? Let's say 10, 20 years ago, feel comfortable to deal with the new environment, which actually frightens some of them, okay? Now, it's a case where unless teachers are in a comfort zone, they're not gonna try and innovate, uh, including things like introducing real world situations into the classroom. We found that, you know, we had to offer a lot of in-service courses 
for teachers whose comfort level was actually very low, you know, to do collaborative learning, collaborative teaching, or to even do simple lesson studies, because they didn't have the confidence to do that. I think with the, with the new teachers, people like know I've got much more confidence that she can handle difficult situations. But it's the teachers who have been basically not exposed to some of the new approaches that are one of the most difficult uh, groups of people to actually deal with, and yet we, we need them, basically. I think every system has, you know, has those teachers. We can't afford to marginalize them. Uh, because to me, every teacher is a you know, valuable resource for that matter. Well, let me move to teachers, and then I'll come back to uh, the conversation. But let me just make two comments to you, because um, the number of tweets that are supporting the idea of eliminating extracurricular activities is significantly high. So that idea is now, again, currency. And the other is that people are saying to us, ultimately, if you adapt the curriculum and your pedagogical approaches to authentic, real-world learning, it requires a different kind of learning environment. And a number of people are saying that our concept of school mm -hmm. as an institution will need to change quite significantly. It's not just a question of changing the organisation of learning, it's a question about changing the environment for learning as well. But I want to come to the challenge because there has been a little bit of pushback from some people who have said they are in the real world, even though they're teachers. So we're getting a little bit of resistance to this. Let me take you into part two of the debate, because it's clear that unless we think about teacher preparation, ongoing development of the educator workforce, and indeed a more differentiated workforce, calling upon many more who can come into the learning game and be part of the teaching learning process, if we don't really attend to the preparation of teachers and the development of teachers, then uh, the promise of real-world learning emerging is unlikely. So, Paul, you are in a position where you're the dean of uh, the preparation for teachers and leaders in the National Institute of Education in Singapore, which some of us in this room regard as being the gold standard. Um, what are you doing? Well, okay. Let, let me address the, kind of the, the question in two parts, because they're, they're related but quite different. The, the, the teacher preparation part versus the continuing professional development part. Yep. I think as you hinted at the beginning, Tony, I think you know, Singapore's you know, seen some dramatic changes because we have jumped basically from a third world to a first world in one generation. So we've got lots of first world kids, but lots of third world mentality teachers. Okay, I'll probably get shot for saying that. <laughs> okay. but, but that's what it is, that's, that's what reality is really. So what have we done to try and address that? And let me just share a couple of things. You know, we, we used to think that Building skills and knowledge for teachers you know, is what's needed. So we started with a model for teacher prep that basically was address three components, attitudes, skills, and knowledge. We then evolved, as, as the country evolved, the second model of dealing with values, skills, and knowledge. Now, we're now realizing that it's actually, that's not enough. Okay? So we've got a new model that we're calling the v -cube SK model, which is V means values three times. Okay? and then skills and knowledge. And the reason for that is that we're finding that as our society changes and, and, and as we move from being a kind of a third world to first world country, people's values change as well. Learners' values change and teachers' values change. So we've got to address all those aspects. So, so in, in our teacher preparation program, we emphasize the V-cube, which is basically learner-centric values and then teacher-centric values and then community-related values. Now to incorporate that in the curriculum, we have very specific activities, okay? And this where it goes, you know, for example, in terms of knowledge, building knowledge, we actually have collaborative learning, which we emphasize quite a bit. And that's where the real world situation comes in. Now for skills building, again, we, we try and facilitate that through, through, through collaborative learning, using real, real case studies. And one of the, the, the skills that we really value, which links to, to the values, is actually reflection. Because we somehow, you know, we have served a lot of, of school systems, and we feel that not enough attention is actually based to the based, sorry, is uh, focused on, on the teacher as a real reflective thinker, okay? And again, I might be old-fashioned here, but I go back to David Cobb's learning cycles and all that kind of stuff, you know, which basically means that you've got to reflect on your experiences, otherwise you're not going to be a good teacher. But the final thing about values which is very interesting is that, you know, we suddenly feel that, okay, even though values can't be taught, they can certainly be imbibed by participating in certain practices. So as part of our teacher preparation program, we actually have 
uh, you could say systematized service learning, okay, where the teachers have to learn values in a group, okay, and this is a collaborative team effort again. They've got to go and do a project, and it's not a co-curricular activity, okay, where they actually have to do some good and understand what values they're learning, both for themselves and for the community. So that's the teacher prep program. Okay. Yep. Now, in terms of professional development, again, very quickly, I think we look at it from the ex situ and in situ viewpoint. Ex situ, I think Andrew showed that, that uh, slide yesterday, that clip yesterday, about professional learning communities. Uh, about two thirds of our schools now function as professional learning communities. And that's where, you know, in terms of the real world situation, uh, the common learning, you know, lesson studies, for example, very common tool amongst those teachers to actually facilitate learning from each other. So a fair amount of emphasis on that, yeah? And then the in situ is where, you know, I do a lot of that, and we don't even call it professional development anymore. We call it professional learning. Because as an academic institution, I really can't claim to significantly affect a teacher's professional development. I can offer opportunities for learning, okay? By either enhancing their content, you know, providing skills, you know, improvement, and so on, really. So that, that's a long way to answer your question, but no, it's a complex topic. It is, yeah, and, and but we're getting a huge amount of Twitter traffic here. Uh, Marwan, but I, can I, as you come in, because you're starting from a different point, let me just let you know there are a few people saying one way of doing this is actually making sure that you ask teachers to give up control in the classroom, uh, and others are saying, let's actually expand the workforce. But um, what's your own view about this? I'm going to be morbid again. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, when you go to, to uh, I come back to developing world, I mean, you know, I, I talk about Palestine, I have real experience, but I mean, Palestine is doing way better than so many of the cases we heard in Africa today, where, you know, you have, you, you cannot you have to go find teachers with, you know, hardly high school experience to come and teach. And this is, you know, you have, I think you have three different uh, calibers, but, but for us in Palestine, the teacher, I mean, I love what they're doing there, and, I, and I, my dream, I've heard somebody, I've been, I've been exposed to the Singaporean experience for some time now, and I, I, I love it, you know, I'd love to think that we want to get to that stage, but I think there are huge obstacles before we can get there. Yeah. And, and one of the problems, I mean, in, in our teacher preparation, is we have 60,000 teachers, 50, approximately 50-some 50 thousand teachers in, in the West Bank and Gaza alone, and those teachers need some serious training and retraining and development. And you have a limited capacity in terms of uh, teacher education programs. And you have limited research capacity and you have limited methodology to come. So basically, what, what, what we're talking about now to get to that stage is, is I think we don't have the resources nor the environment nor the educational system nor the people that can do that. And we don't have $10 billion maybe, I don't know how long, how much it would take to get people, teachers to that stage. So I personally, from that perspective, you know, I, I have a problem with that. And I'd like eventually maybe later talk about some ideas on that. But, yeah. but right now, um, you know, I think that there are serious obstacles that people have to be aware of. And what everybody keeps thinking, you know, people have to come break out of this box that you can only have a good educational system. This is, this is a charge statement. I'm saying that people say that you can only have a good educational system if you have good teachers. We have to think of an alternative model where you can have a good educational system. You can possibly have a good educational system if you don't necessarily have good teachers. If you have good teachers, it will work for sure. I'm not saying that this is wrong. But I'm saying we have to think of a model where without good teachers, you can do something. You need to think of this model for the developing world. If you don't find such a model, it's hopeless. We're just going to be doing little tests here, little pilots there, little you know, interventions there, and the educational system is not going to get better because developing countries, the one that needs education most, are the ones that are the poorest, are the ones that have the highest population uh, rates, that means the number of students is growing further and further, and the economic situation is not getting any better for those countries, means that the money available for those countries is getting lower. So the chance is we're not going to be getting better, but things are going to start deteriorating for those countries. Okay, Mohamed, let me just tell you, uh, Noah, as you come in, there are three suggestions being made about how you can supplement and complement a core professional teaching force 
particularly where you're challenged to have that quality and that quantity. One is technology. Two is a more differentiated workforce. People are talking about paraprofessionals and others mm -hmm. who can support. And three is that they say you need to play in the help of social entrepreneurs, not-for-profits, corporations, a range of others who can actually support learning. Now, you might want to come back on that, but let me go to Noah first and then I'll come back. Okay, Noah? Well, I think in working with the Syrian Refugee Education Project, um, there's been a question of sustainability. We don't want to necessarily have this dependent upon us or anyone coming in, so we want to make use of Syrian refugee teachers to teach or mentor or whatever, guide Syrian refugee children. And, you know, we kind of stopped for a minute and said, wait, do we really want Syrian refugee teachers who have taught for 10, 20, 30 years in a certain model of kind of being the center of attention and just pouring knowledge into children's minds. Do we really want them to be at the center of this, of this education project? And the answer is not necessarily. The answer is, well, maybe we want to, d to redefine what a teacher is and maybe redefine who we consider candidates for teachers. Maybe volunteers or parents are better candidates for this than teachers themselves. And just to give you a background, um, you know, our project doesn't seek to open up more schools of the same model that, have, that has been, you know, exhibited for the past 100 years in most countries. It seeks to open non-traditional forms of education in terms of, you know, setting up an environment, be it a tent in a refugee camp, or be it, you know, even like a structure, but, you know, keep it as open as possible, keep it as flexible as possible for it to evolve with the needs of the children. Um, that's not to say that, you know, all teachers should go out of you know, go out of their jobs and completely lose their jobs. Um, it's just to say that this is really the start of a new movement where we're recognizing that, you know, we don't know what the future holds. We need to be able to prepare our kids for something that is um, gonna be, you know, ever evolving, ever changing. They need to be critical thinkers. They need to be resourceful. They need to be independent. Um, they need to be able to think for themselves and learn on their own if need be. And so this redefinition of the teaching uh, position would include something that, you know, I mean, as Marwan has said, you know, something where even if you have bad teachers, the curriculum or the structure or the way the system is set up is such that students can still learn and can still excel. So I think that's, you know, spot okay, on. Okay, that's good. Thank you. But let me just uh, say as you come in that a number of people here are saying, what about the shift of power to young people themselves? Okay, so can we be clear that the learner should be at the centre of this work? Okay, which is exactly your point, Noah. Let me go here. Yeah, my name is Wang Chun Hong. Uh, I'm from China. I did the creative art therapies on autis autistic children and uh, mental disabled people. So I think the title is very important for us uh, because right in the right way we we were very hard to teach those kind of people what uh, we think is educated to them or what the the knowledge as before or as normal people so that's very important to, to let uh, all the teachers of the special needed stu uh, student that uh, they they know how to use the life way the life way or uh, what happened on their goal, on their uh, life, and uh, to community. Of course, the education is uh, one, one goal is uh, to community with them, right? Or let them community, communication with, with normal people. But when they have a, a, a language problem, you know, the, uh, the, the difficult time is uh, to the teacher is, how can they understand exactly the, the, the knowledge yeah. uh, compared to the life, life thinking? Yes. You know, the more way, uh, the more function is uh, when you teach them how to thinking about the problem in the life. And then the skill of your education, your teaching will be in life. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Can I go to here? Thank you. Um, my name is Joanne McPike, and I am the founder of a school called Think Global, and it is a school that travels the world and uh, studies in three countries a year. The teachers and students move. So they experience real life learning um, every single day. Um, their kids have become very resilient and open-minded and we have 36 children from 20 countries at the moment who travel with us. Um, we use the countries as much as we can um, in our lessons. Uh, in China, they studied math on the Great Wall. Um, and in Ecuador, we did science in the Galapagos Islands. And uh, at the moment, they're in Buenos Aires, and they're studying the boom writers and cafes where, where the writers used to sit. And we encourage our teachers to get out of the classroom as much as possible. And we use technology to share the experiences with the, with the rest of the world. Um, what we've found is the teachers are so happy to get out of the classroom when given the opportunity. I think that a lot of times teachers would love to get out of the classroom but are not allowed to by, um, by the school administration and things like that. I think that um, maybe they should even just very slowly start allowing them to get out of the classroom, do a math class under a tree. Um, one of the... One of the biggest um, issues that, that we have with real life learning is how do you grade it? How do you assess real life learning? And I've spoken to a couple of college um, admissions people because um, you know, I'm not a great fan of standardized tests, but you know, their question to me is, well, how do you grade critical thinking? How do you grade, um, how do you grade real life learning? Thank you. Thank you very much. I want the microphone back to the gentleman who had it before. So, sir, can you wave? Thank you. Okay, so, yes, that's right. And then can I get this microphone up to the back? Uh, there's uh, people waving, keep on going. No, sorry, I'm going to, right behind the, sir, the, the gentleman who spoke before. Wave right there. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. So, let me go to you first. I would like first to introduce myself. I'm coming from Senegal, and I'm the national coordinator of the UNESCO Associated Schools Network in my country. And uh, our objective is to teach students how to live together. This is an expression which involves many things. And it's why uh, things like um, um, word heritage, sustainable development, or things like democracy, peace, and justice, human rights, education, are things we are dealing with. Yes. And uh, our objective is to the main objective of the schools, associated schools, is to develop education projects through this team, through these activities, where children are in the center of the activities, of learning activities. And my, uh, uh, to, my, to my opinion, education is not only uh, something you can get from books. I think that extra activities and uh, some activities out of schools and um, activities which can help students solve real life education are very important. And it's why, for example, in, in, our, uh, in our country, in our schools, we, school, we often develop some kind of project educations, like uh, a project which uh, is very important for me is a sandwich project dealing with problems of environment and where students themselves go in their locations and adapt a beach. They adapt a beach and they try to first to 
select all the problems which are on this beach and try to find out solutions to them. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Oh. Now, I'm going to get one more here, and then I'm going back to the panel. Thank you. My English is not very good, and I speak Spanish. Okay. Soy Martin Barrandegui. My name is Martin Barrandegui. I'm a teacher in, uh, in international Salta. schools in the University uh, of Salta. I'm also a member of the OSA. Every year I start my course saying that there are no silly questions, but silly people who do not ask the questions they want. That's why I try to encourage pupils to ask questions. I want my students to ask. I remember Benjamin Franklin, who asked his sons when they came back from school, how many questions have you, have you asked today in school? Why? Because by asking questions, you can learn. There's something else I found interesting. Mr. Teng said something about teachers who find it hard to go back to training courses, to become students again. He spoke about teachers who find it very hard to get acquainted with technology because they haven't been, they haven't been trained to use technology. What I want to ask is to Mr. Ten, how did you manage to encourage teachers to go back to the classroom to be acquainted with technology. Thank you. Paul, a quick response to the question. How did you encourage teachers to go back to the classroom and get acquainted with technology? Well, well, well briefly, two ways, really. One is to develop in-service courses that are really experiential learning in-service courses when you get to practice and deal with real-world situations. That's one, so course offerings as part of professional learning. Second is that we've got a rather unique situation in Singapore because the teachers are not financially hindered. As some of you know, every teacher is given 100 hours of free training a year. And they actually have to find time to use that training or learning for that matter. Yeah? So those are the kind of two twin forces that we have. The third, of course, is that we've got a very strong learning sciences group that does research and also develops training courses. We've got quite, quite a big group of people that actually are looking at various aspects of technology and the science behind using technology, which is why I mentioned TPAC just now, the technology pedagogical content knowledge, which actually evolved from the, the pedagogical content knowledge. So those are the three pillars on which I think we encourage teachers to go back. Yeah. Colleagues, I'm going to take you to part three of the debate, and then I'll come back, OK? But I need to uh, ask you this, and I think, Marwan, you were the person that, in a sense, has framed the big question that we have before us. Even if we have a different view about how we define real-world learning, and I've heard that it encompasses everything from the personal through to issues of global security and sustainability, right, and the entire skill set that we're going to need in order to make sure that we're healthy and happy as individuals and that we're actually a sustainable human race. So that's, that's the kind of continuum of real-world learning that people have talked about. And we've got a debate about the nature of the role of the learner, the teacher, others who are going to actually participate in the teaching learning, and your very point now about the fact that this is now up for grabs, even though we've got Andrea saying yesterday that no system can actually reach the high levels of performance without actually placing the quality teacher at the centre, so we've got a debate. But the big debate, I think, that's emerging through the Twitter feed is how do you, in your language, Marwan, take this to scale. We've got plenty of examples of people who are doing remarkable real-world learning, but you don't necessarily have a whole ecosystem of real-world learning. Now, this, I think, is going to be the challenge for us. And in some environments, the conditions are not that conducive. You've already raised that. So, Paul, start us off. Here you are in Singapore, already, as you say, having gone from a place which was certainly not at the top of the PISA scales, yeah? So what's your next step in terms of progressing real-world learning? What are you now aiming for as the next generation of your work? Paul? 
Okay, well, okay technology certainly is a facilitator. Okay, and I think you know, we tend to emphasize technology in, you know, in Singapore because we're actually, in a sense, driven by the ecosystem itself. Because we've got learners, even young students, as you saw in, in, in the video clip, who are so versatile with technology. Okay? So unless we tap into that, we're actually missing a real opportunity okay, to actually evolve into a more complicated learning ecosystem. Okay? Uh, I actually don't have a good answer for, you, for your question, but I think we're now recognizing to the limits of technology and the limits of traditional learning, okay? right. both for teachers and for learners, which yeah. is why, back to your question of classrooms, yeah. You know? yeah. We're finding now that we actually we've restructured, for example, our institute. We've totally restructured our teaching rooms into collaborative learning classrooms. No more the kind of didactic lecture room style anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's made a world of difference yeah. for learners. Yeah. That, that's one. Second is the thing about project work and real life situations. There's a whole gradation, so we take people out to deal with real situations. But the, the core of that is still values. Yeah. And, and actually, and my my kind of difficult task really is how do you maintain that passion in teachers? You know, to continue being a teacher and yet keep up with the times, basically. Okay? Uh, and to do that, we were putting in all kinds of facilitators at the moment, including you know, professional learning courses. But this is only part of that. Okay? You also need other pathways, government policy support, for example. You need to have understanding family environments mm -hmm. for teachers that you want to improve themselves. I mean, all those add together. Yeah. So. Okay, no, you are the next generation. Okay? Uh, you're an advocate for real-world learning. How are you going to make sure that it spreads globally? And I want you to feel a personal responsibility to do this. Yeah? I absolutely do. Okay. <laughs> if not me, then who? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, wanna, I do want to point out that it's, it's great that we're having this conversation and it's great that other people are, are with us and, you know, the statistic that we have on the survey. But unfortunately, most of the world is against us, quite, quite honestly. And they say, well, you know, what you say is great, and, and, and we agree that that's, that's going to lead to some really great leaders in the world, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's not scalable, and it's not scalable in an affordable way. So uh, I was actually attending a talk about the uh, make maker culture the other week yes. at MIT. And uh, in the Q&A session, one person raised their hand and said, you know, I'm the uh, co-founder of Fab Lab in Egypt. And I'm approached all the time by funders and potential sponsors that say, uh, what's the evidence that this is even worth investing in? And um, you know, she says, well, how am I supposed to show? You know, how am I supposed to show that critical thinking and, and, and all this great stuff is happening? And another person raised their hand immediately and said, oh my god. You know, please, whatever you do, please don't try to assess this. Because the moment that you try to assess this, it's all gonna go down the drain. And so it's almost as if he was saying that, you know, school, I mean, well, this is up, up for grabs as well, but you know, potentially school is, is there and it's useful and it has its uses and there's assessment and you should, should be tested for proficiency. I certainly don't want a doctor that hasn't passed his biology courses. I don't think anyone here does either. But maybe there, there is room for creating programs that are outside of school, that are, yeah. you know, happening in people's yeah. garages yeah. or people's basements. The blurred and, line between formal and informal. Right. Okay. And, 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 and if you see kids' interest in that, that's a statistic. You know, if 80 kids are choosing to, yep. to use their Saturday afternoon to yep. go to a maker fair. Yep. Let's see what the demand side does. Marwan, come in, help us here, because uh, we might have to think outside the box. All right. So um, I, I'd like to talk about... Uh, uh, a model that, that we're working on now. So what, what we did, we said, okay, we're stuck with uh, a system, a curricular. We have to work with this system, uh, the system, the, the formal educational system. So we go out, we get the textbooks of the educational system, and we look at the intended learning outcomes section by section. This is something we're working on now. So we take the objectives of each lesson, and then we develop what we call learning objects or uh, extended learning objects and those learning objects produce address the same uh, objectives required from the textbook but we do it we put in it 
problem solving, creative thinking, critical thinking, writing, real world learning, we integro integrate those elements into the, uh, those learning objects. And then we take those learning objects and we give them to teachers to go teach in the classroom. So suddenly, we have a teacher now has a set of what we call learning objects. They include activities, resources, digital media. It could have a lot of digital media resources available all over. And then, most importantly, activities that allow the learner and the students to go and do something in the real world, to think, to write, to think of multidisciplinary work. We're no longer teaching, for example, science for the sake of science. You're teaching science for the sake of learning, for inquisition, etc. And so, so in this case, once you give this to a teacher, what happens, the teacher no longer needs to be the only source of knowledge and information and the driver. The teacher becomes a facilitator of the learning process, which is well described into this learning object. I mean, uh, I know we're running out of time. We could talk more about that, but, but this is the gist of the, 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 the model that we're working on now. Well, and that's fantastic. Colleagues, we have run out of time, but can I just do this in closing? Uh, people have asked about the question of purpose. We talked about the fact that real world learning is now a given, but a number of the Twitter feeds have said, can we be clear that real world learning is in the service of appropriate skill acquisition, refreshing the skills you need in order to be successful in a 21st century environment, to help you to generate solutions to the problems that we face. That's why you need real world learning. But thirdly, they're saying, and have a look at this in the WISE book, Learning a Living. The third level is create opportunities that will allow us all to think about a more sustainable world. So this is just the beginning of a debate, colleagues. I'm sorry we've run out of time. So with your approval, or even without it, I'm going to close the debate, but I want you to thank the three panel members. Thank you very much. <laughs>